So, good evening. Um, I'd like to thank the Bossom family and the RSA for inviting me to deliver the 2010 Bossom Lecture. I'm delighted uh, that Will Hutton has been kind enough to introduce my talk and that my guests here tonight include Sir Clive Bossom and Lady Bossom and Bruce and Penelope Bossom. To speak in the shadow of Alfred Bossom is challenging. He was one of the fathers of American skyscraper design, building across North America. And one wonders what further this famously energetic and cultured man might have achieved in America in terms of designing historically important buildings had he not chosen to return to Britain in 1926, three years before the Wall Street crash, to become a constituency MP and a highly influential cultural figure here. The spirit of Alfred Bossom is highly relevant because of his profound interest in the architecture of Central America. And this forms a link to much of my subject matter this evening. In Britain, we generally build to a level of quality that matches our particular ambitions. However, and sadly too often in my view, a failure to think long-term, a lack of appreciation of context, and a compulsion to build at the lowest possible cost all conspire against delivering quality. We could build better, particularly given this country's relative political security, but we don't. So what then if we're working in an environment where there is profound uncertainty, deprivation, or disorder. In Haiti, for example, where my practice has worked for a number of years, average earnings are less than $1.50 a day. The average life expectancy is 55 years. Actually, interestingly, that's equivalent to parts of Glasgow where the average life expectancy is 55 years. And in India, where we also have a number of projects, we tend now to hear more about its explosive economic growth rather than the fact that 40% of families still live on $2 a day or less. This evening, I'm going to present a number of my practices, initiatives and projects here and overseas, which in differing ways respond to the need to improve lives and build better communities, often in challenging circumstances. Ten years ago, my practice established a bursary for young designers in partnership with the Institution of Civil Engineers. Can we just put the lights down a little bit, maybe? I don't know if it's possible to dim them a bit. Oh, now I can't see a thing. Um, <laughs> just, I, you know, we designed this room. And you can't do one or the other. It's a bit like at home. You can dim some lights, but you can't dim the other. So this, I guess you can't have a light here, but not a light. I thought there was a lectern light. No? Um, well, if, if somebody can figure out a lectern light. We can see it. I, I know, but they do get a little thin, some of the slides. So if somebody can resolve a, a lectern light and put the lights down, that would be great. If not, I'll continue. Ten years ago, my practice established a bursary for young designers in partnership with the Institution of Civil Engineers and the Royal Institute of British Architects. The idea was to encourage students and recent graduates of engineering and of architecture to collaborate in the design of low cost but effective projects which improve people's lives. Bursary outputs are research based and highly varied. The first illustrated here is a prototype emergency relief shelter. This was the winner of the first bursary um, and now being developed further by Tom Caselis and his team in Geneva. A shade structure for an Indian village established for dis a displaced community, developed by Craig Bamford from the Bartlett School. A tea dance for pensioners in the East End of London 
designed to, strength, to strengthen their sense of belonging in a rapidly changing environment. Designed by uh, Sophie Handler, developed by Sophie Handler. And an innovative housing system for refugees on the Thai-Burmese border. Uh, we're running a little from, I don't know if Julia or Asif, are you here? Ah, Asif, do you want to say something about this just from there? Please shout out. was remarkable about Julia and Asif was that I remember they, they came to my office and uh, with, a, with a plea for money and it was a very modest sum. I think it was about £6,700. Oh, Julia, you were there. And I think that was to finish the project. So we, we said, fine, we'll give you £6,700. And they came back a year later having built this remarkable project, having surveyed the whole of the refugee camp, having produced this extraordinary documentation and I said, well, you, you know, do you need any more cash? You must need some more cash. And they said, no, they've still got three and a half thousand pounds left. <laughs> so I thought, well, I mean, I, I said, keep it, please. Don't, don't, don't get it back. And, and um, there are more, many more examples. Thanks very much, uh, Asif and Julia. All de not at all. Uh, all de <laughs> that's enough, thank you. All developed <laughs> by, emergent, by emerging designers. It's like email trilogy. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> by emerging designers with inquiring minds and a can-do attitude. Projects like, projects like these encourage us to re-examine the meaning of the phrase building better communities. These modestly scaled endeavors question our ability to understand and to accept human difference. They question our ability to design effectively. Wherever possible, we aim to expand the threshold and impact of our architectural commissions by generating parallel locally based initiatives that make a difference. Of an individual commission. This is an illustration of photo we took today actually looking southeast from St Pancras to our new uh, project at Kings Cross Station developed for Network Rail with Arup. And so from the right to the left is the great, well we're standing on St Pancras threshold, it's a Great Northern Hotel um, the King's Cross, the new Western Concourse, um, designed to, to, to not obscure the Grade 1 listed facade of the, of the station and complete for the, for the Olympics. For instance, one of our most challenging ongoing projects is the transformation of King's Cross Station for Network Rail, which is illustrated here, which is not only on the doorstep of Camden, Islington and Bloomsbury, but is also at the heart of one of Europe's centers of regeneration. Within the King's Cross threshold and close by the contemporary art center we formed at the Roundhouse, illustrated here, is the new Horizon Youth Center. This is a place that works hard to reconnect young adults with their communities. And here we established a design competition to extend the existing center and selected the emerging architect, Adam Kahn, for the job. Adam's intervention have delivered a fine piece of new design with a wonderful barn-like volume at its heart, integrating well with the existing building fabric and opening up a wide range of possibilities for both its users and its local communities. And now to some of our overseas initiatives undertaken in slightly more challenging environments than uh, even in King's Cross. Here's the cover of Graham Greene's novel, The Comedians, a bleak satire about 1960s Haiti. Greene called the book entertainment, even though he was writing about a country riddled with corruption and systematic repression under the rule of Papadoc de Valier. Once one of the richest countries in the Western Hemisphere, it had become one of its poorest. 
However, in the 18th century and before its independence, Haiti, then known as Saint Dominique, was France's most valuable colony, accounting for much of its foreign trade and producing half of all the sugar and all the coffee consumed in Europe. Commercially, it was as significant, as significant a colony to the French as India was to the British. And here's a map, and for those of you who don't know, Haiti's on the right-hand side. It forms the eastern, the western um, end of uh, edge of Hispaniola. In recent years, and prior to January's devastating earthquake, there had been signs that Haiti's economic and political situation was stabilizing, and a sense that, in time, it might even compete with its much wealthier neighbor, the Dominican Republic. In 2008, as part of this growing stability, the Clinton Foundation asked my practice to work alongside it on a number of its emerging Haiti-based initiatives. Set up by President Clinton in 2005 to develop innovative solutions to global challenges of education, poverty alleviation, climate change, and public health, the Clinton Foundation has raised billions of dollars for its mission and in doing so has transformed the lives of over 250 million people in over uh, 170 countries. Our initial project in Haiti with the Clinton Foundation was to develop a template for low-cost low community settlements in rural areas, which is illustrated here. Um, essentially, we took a, a he one hectare land, a notional uh, site of a hectare, and planned a community around a, 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 a settlement around a community building with houses built for about $5,000 each, 350 square feet, so very compact. But we felt it was a model that, that, that could offer a, an opportunity to, um, to be developed further by others. My practice's master planning director, Aidan Potter, developed this initial concept uh, in 2009, when the housing situation in Haiti was already pressing. But it became stunningly urgent on June the, and January the 12th of this year when, um, tight, when a level seven earthquake ravaged Port-au-Prince and its immediate surroundings. Some days later, and following more than 50 aftershocks, we were left with the cruelest of statistics. At least 250,000 Haitians had perished in the earthquake. 1.5 million people were left homeless or displaced. A quarter of a million homes and thousands of schools, health centers, and businesses lay in ruins. And much of the infrastructure in Port-au-Prince was all but destroyed. My practice's role with the Clinton Foundation changed instantly with a request for us to develop our initial community settlement concept further into a housing reconstruction strategy in partnership with the Haitian government. I mean, some, we've had some difficult projects, but I have to say this was the mo has been the most difficult. Our first step was to plan a housing expo in Port-au-Prince with the intention to create a critical mass of expertise and cooperation. The global response to this endeavor has been extraordinary. Some 375 consortia from more than 30 countries, including a significant proportion, uh, representation from Haiti, representing partnerships between over 1,000 housing suppliers, NGOs, multidisciplinary consultants, green tech providers, universities, and others, have stepped forward to take part in the expo, which after some uh, planning and, and, a, and a degree of, de of delay, is scheduled to, scheduled to commence in the third week of January 2011. Post-Expo, our aim is to assist the Haitian government to set up a community housing program, trialing a range of the housing types, both within and out with Port-au-Prince. And illustrated here are just some of the, the ideas that have come forward for the housing expo with a requirement that they have to be safe, performance-based, built for less than $5,000 each, involving local skills, and wherever possible, interpreting the local tradition. The Expo is fully funded by organizations including the Clinton Foundation, the Inter-American Development Bank, the Digicel Corporation, Deutsche Bank, 
and others, with pledges totaling $5 million. The British ambassador to Haiti, Stephen Fisher, has come forward with a significant contribution. And critically, the process going forward is being led by the government of Haiti. Designing better communities in challenging environments is about capacity building at source, job creation, and finding ways to make maximum use of local, uh, locally available resources. In Haiti, it's also about developing rebuilding strategies in the face, in the face of political uncertainty, funding, shortage, funding shortages, and complex land tenure issues. And ultimately, also in the case of Haiti, it's about unlocking the $10 billion of international aid already pledged for reconstruction by donor countries, funds which can't flow into the country until a comprehensive rebuilding strategy has been put in place by the Haitian government and its recent, recently established Interim Reconstruction Commission. Having said that, $10 billion uh, to rebuild Haiti a sum equivalent to Britain's bailout this week of the Irish banks seems a modest sum to me. Better designed and safely constructed houses will be vital to Haiti's social and economic recovery. So will the repair of highly symbolic buildings, perhaps none more so than the historic iron market in Port-au-Prince, which is featured on Haitian banknotes. The iron market was originally designed and fabricated by French engineers in 1890 and designed as a railway station bound for Cairo, somehow ending up in Haiti and erected as its city market. We don't know why. For 120 years, it served as the focus of commercial life in Port-au-Prince until it was severely damaged by a fire in 2008. I first visited the market immediately following the fire and despite its perilous condition, I was overwhelmed by its, the possibilities and by the dignity and resourcefulness of the traders displaced by the fire who continued to live and work around the market. This was truly the heart of Port-au-Prince and I was determined to help and rebuild it. This January's earthquake caused further significant damage, pulling down much of the surviving south building and severely damaging the central pavilion and its minaret towers with a, a fire. Immediately following the earthquake, I visited the uh, ruined market with Dennis O'Brien, the Irish entrepreneur whose Digicel Corporation is one of Haiti's leading employers. So this is looking sort of south, southeast with the, what was left of the southern market, the north market had been destroyed in 2008, and the, the uh, minarets, as a pointer, isn't it? And interestingly, it wasn't the, it wasn't the, um, how does this work? It wasn't the earthquake which caused these to collapse. It was the fact, if you remember the banknotes, you might not, but there was a concrete deck that had been put between the two markets in the 70s to get more space. It collapsed, and in doing so, pulled the rest of the, pulled the minarets and the, the northern end of the southern market down with it. With the help of scores of local, uh, skilled local artisans, we are rebuilding the market using reclaimed original materials wherever possible. We are re-erecting the central pavilion and minarets and transforming the market's usability with the development of a long-term market plan. The restored iron market is scheduled to reopen in January 2011, one year after the earthquake. My practice is also developing plans for a cultural quarter around the market, which we hope will encourage artisan activity and, in time, generate tourist potential. Um, and I don't know, is John Milton here? Yeah. John, do you, do you want to just say something? John is the construction director on the iron market. And John, do you just want to say something just very quickly? And you don't have to, about the, the difficulties of... I mean, it's dead easy for me to show the slides, but you have taken on the strategy of reconstruction. Yeah, I know. But. Um, just to add to the photograph you're seeing there, I, I'm speaking to uh, the steel erectors just this afternoon. And the clock tower is already re-erected. The minarets go on 
next week. The roof will be on by the end of next week. That will be probably the middle of the following week. And uh, although we had a slow start, John, um, they're cracking on with it now. And with, um, I'm, I'm Great. And um, John's played a, really the leading role in, in programming and organizing and, and pushing us on, on program and, and it's an extraordinary job. The resurrected iron market will surely become a symbol of two ideas that have become a rallying cries in Haiti. L'espoir, hope, and tête collée, the creole call for unity. It will also serve as a remarkable legacy for its sponsor, Dennis O'Brien. Not every project to help build better communities demands such significant interventions as in Haiti. Sometimes, compromised lives and communities can be improved by much smaller initiatives. Here are images from Delhi, where thousands of people, the majority of them women and children, live and work as waste pickers on landfill sites. What a contrast to images portraying India in the last decade that of rapid growth and an emerging and increasingly affluent professional class. Let's remember, this is a country that expects to achieve double-digit GDP growth in coming years and plans to spend a trillion dollars on infrastructure alone by 2017. Yet four out of every ten of its people remain living below the poverty threshold. Having encountered the Chintan charity, which specifically supports Delhi's waste pickers, I commissioned India's most celebrated photojournalist, Raghu Rai, to record the lives of waste pickers and their families on Delhi's largest landfill site. And despite its content, and perhaps oddly to some, I find his photographic essay curiously uplifting, dignifying lives that might otherwise be considered so wretched. Ragu's images are also being published in book form with proceeds going to Chintan to support their remarkable work. This project may not immediately lead to transforming waste pickers' lives, but I do hope it will at least serve to draw awareness to their lives at a time of such explosive wealth creation in India. With three, over three million sufferers, India's HIV AIDS problem is acute. Historically, doctors, rather than nurses, have provided HIV AIDS identification and treatment in India. The new Indian Institute of Advanced Nursing we're designing in Chennai will address this by training postgraduate nurses with the skills to address HIV AIDS prevention and treatment. The project, a public-private par partnership between the Indian Ministry of Health and Yale University's School of Nursing will be the first of 15 IIAN campuses built across India, ultimately training tens of thousands of nurses a year. We're developing an extremely low-cost uh, design with Arab engineers for the Chennai facility, using locally available materials with, with, and minimal energy, which, we hope, will result in a high-quality, responsive, and engaging environment. I'd like to end by showing you a project which my practice is particularly proud of. It began in 2007 as a very modest endeavor, but we think it has major implications. And Hannah, I'm going to ask you just to say a few words in a minute, if you're okay. The brief was to design a model community school in Malawi, one of Africa's poorest nations, for the country's Ministry of Education that was easy to construct and maintain and, use, and used locally available materials. Ten of these schools have been built to date, by the way, this isn't the school we built, with many more now planned for the country's physically isolated communities as the newly adopted Ministry of Education standard design for rural schools. More than a million primary school-aged children in Malawi cannot be educated simply because there are not enough teachers or school buildings and teaching and learning conditions are often enervating because many of its 5,000 existing schools are grim and bunker-like like this, with few windows 
and poor ventilation. Hannah, do you want to just say something about the existing schools, or shall I go on? Pardon? Please go on. Okay. We thought that you were going to have to shout, I think. We, we thought that, do you want to maybe come down, and then you can just talk at the end, then people can hear you. No? We thought the commission offered a tremendous opportunity to radically improve school design in Malawi and potentially elsewhere in Africa. And through this, the quality of education for its young people. And we were sure we could do this simply and practically by bringing the highest level of design skill to bear. My practice as Director of Education, the wonderful Hannah Lawson, led the project from the outset, designing a school template that was transferable to varying sites and in all cases would improve the quality of internal light and environmental performance, critically for no more than the typical cost of new schools elsewhere in Malawi. That's £15,000 or $25,000 a school, each catering for up to 150 children. The schools are located in remote areas. Water and building materials are li limited. The climate and topography is often harsh. When we began the project, there were no design standards in Malawi, so we worked with Arup to create them, reducing classroom temperatures by three degrees centigrade and significantly increasing daylight and ventilation. Taking the standard pre-existing school block, essentially two back-to-back -back classrooms, our approach was to, to, was to pull the rooms apart, creating a covered central terrace with double doors to classrooms either side, as illustrated, bookended by open teaching spaces shaded by overhanging roofs. This configuration effectively creates five teaching spaces for the price of two. It has been a particular pleasure, I think, for us to see mothers gathering on the terraces, not just to watch their children to be being taught, but in many cases to learn what their children are learning. Now, Hannah, do you want, do you want to? You'll have to probably, ah, brilliant. various technologies that we can use to solve the problems in Malawi. And what myself and the team and, and Arabs, who were just exemplary in this, had to face was how could we design without the typical tools and technologies we have to combat heat and, and issues that they just have to deal with on a daily basis. So we really had to kind of go back to grassroots of architecture and look at how we could use local materials and effectively soil to, to build good quality learning environments with great natural ventilation, good daylight, and just enjoyable learning sort of spaces. But I think as John was saying, perhaps the move we made most significantly was to work with the community to find out how we could get these schools back into their community as at the, kind of, at the heart of the community in the way the traditional school in, and village would have been in um, historically. And that was really key to making them take ownership of these buildings and to use them and to look after them and to, for them to have longevity. Education is new in Malawi. And what was most challenging was how to get parents to put their girls particularly into school. And in, doing, in making it their building and making it their community centre as well as their school by giving them the end bays and the central bay where the mothers would hang out, where the men would even play cards of an evening. It didn't really matter what they were doing. By being there, the school became part of their community and they were no longer afraid or sort of sceptical of sending their children there. So I think that for us was probably the most significant change that design allowed. Thanks. And it was Hannah whose team uh, completed the, the new RSA Academy. Thanks very much. Um, I can't think of any project we've undertaken that so clearly demonstrates the link between effective design, community benefit, and improved lives. So will our efforts in Haiti bear fruit for Haitians? Will Ragu Rai's photographic essay of Delhi's waste pickers influence the way the environment is thought about in a country now in hyper-growth mode? And in Malawi, who will be the first child to begin their education in one of the new rural community schools and then graduate onto university in Africa? Obviously, I don't have the, quest the answers to any of these questions. But what I do know is that any architect who works to build better communities in challenging physical, cultural, or political situations must anchor their projects practically and humanely in a plain desire to find ways to improve the way people live, learn, and work. I repeat, 
Building better communities in challenging environments is not about charity. Building better communities is an ethical challenge. We live in an, in an extraordinary 21st century of ideas and change. This demands new, kind, new kinds of engagement with people and with places. And to be meaningful, these engagements must trigger a further spirit of engagement. What I, for, what I hope for most is that the projects I've illustrated here tonight, which sit at the heart of what my practice does, are seen not as ends in themselves, but as at the beginning of building better communities. Thanks. Great. Um, well, reactions, thoughts? Uh, Haiti, Malawi, India, very impressive. Uh, Wonderful places. Yeah, but I, I was very impressed by the, uh, I thought, the, I mean, uh, they're all good examples, but I thought the, uh, I was particularly taken with the school and the way that you could get, uh, by making it come alive, you turned it from being a kind of a dead space into a, into a live space, I mean, that's a classic, I mean, to come back to the things we were saying at the beginning, a classic, you know, nudge. <laughs>